everybody in this world uses money, or almost everybody, every single day, but so little people think about what it is, how it works, how maybe it could work in another way, how we attach all our values to money. And also, uh, what I'm going to do here, I started on a journey exploring money. I'm going to tell some stories, share some thoughts, uh, talk about how money works, but also how the way money works has influenced and changed our minds and our perception of value. I've been an artist all my life, as long as I can remember. I've been drawing, creating, making stuff, painting. And for me, art is something, it's an expression of your inner self. It's very spiritual, it's very personal. It's something, it's value lies in the fact that you touch people. But then, what did I notice? When you look in the real world and you see a newspaper, you will hardly read about art on the, news, on the front page of a newspaper, unless it gets sold for a lot of money. If there's a Picasso sold for 100 million, or this Cezanne card player painting sold for 250 million dollars, that's when you read about money. But what do those figures say about its social value, spiritual value? And that was kind of the thing where uh, I, I saw that even that thing, what for me was so important and so spiritual and so emotional, got pinpointed and quantified by money. So that's where it started. But then. When you're an artist and you have a material, you need to know your material. When you use paint, acrylic paint, oil paint, you have to study it, figure out stuff. So what did I do? I started studying money. And I came from a very, I think as a lot of artists do, anti-money background, because artists are, in a way, a very interesting species. It's one of the few, I think, on this in our society who do things out of intrinsic motivation. You don't do things for money, you do them because you need to express yourselves and there are dreams you want to reach, and there always was something in between me and my dreams, and that was that nuisance in our world called money. I sometimes uh, compared life to like this playground, but also a parking lot, and you just needed to keep throwing in money, otherwise you get kicked, kicked off the playground. But then I started looking at money. And when you look at money, it, there is not a lot to be anti-money. There's not a lot to be pro-money either, but money is not a lot anymore. It's not backed by gold. I mean, already since 40 years, it doesn't even exist anymore in a tangible form. Like only 3% of our transactions are real money. The rest are just digits. So it's just an agreement. And uh, this weird thing about agreement is that if everybody would know it, we could use it to exchange things and we could start our own agreements. I will talk about that later. The nice thing is since it is nothing, we can, but it's based on trust. I mean, we can trust bankers or we can trust our friends, our community. If you'll see our banknotes, they're printed with silver foil. They're really, uh, I mean, I think I can say they're beautiful. So part of their value lies in their beauty in another form than financial value. But by using denomination zero, it makes you think and it's like you as a person can say what its value is. And there is something, uh, there's also a rainbow there. It says searching for the root of all evil at the end of the rainbow. But there's this other thing. When I started studying money, there's money is the root of all evil. But when you see where it comes from, it comes from the bi Bible. And originally it says the love of money is the root of all evil. And I think that's a big difference. Money is in a way, as I said, I don't think there's a lot to be pro or anti-money. It's just a means of exchange. But it developed into something else where it's not just a means of exchange, but it's this magical thing. We want, we need to multiply. Everybody wants more money instead of exchanging more. The zero banknote also leads me again to the Burning Man Festival. So money is not allowed there. We went there with their bank and obviously we could not exchange real money because it's not allowed. And what happens there for the whole week, there is no money. When it's not there, it kind of frees your mind. And what did we do? We came with the bank and we decided to fill, fill that void of no money with money but making people think. Because a lot of people, they go to Burning Man and it's great, it's this place, there's no money, but before that they rent a really expensive RV, max out their platinum card, buy lots of other stuff, then there's no mobile reception at Burning Man, but today they drive back, they're already really nervously with their iPhone because they need to pay their mortgage, they need to buy all this other stuff, assignments they have to do. So instead of looking at it as, as a vacation, a void of money, we thought we should ask people, like, what do they do with their money? Because if money is nothing, 
but it is an agreement. It's important when we exchange it that we look where do we exchange it to. Like if we buy stuff, a lot of uh, people think buying material stuff, consuming, it's a one-way transaction. You just get something. But they tend to forget that you give something back. You give money back. And since when used, we can do a lot of things with money. I mean, we can make this festival here. We can build communities. I think it's very important that we use, we are really conscious every time we use money, how we exchange it and where, where we use it. And what we did at Burning Man was asking people, like, whenever they would have done something which is bad for their karma, maybe not following their dreams, doing something bad for Mother Earth, for their friends, just because of money. And then everybody would have this point in his life where we did something wrong. And when they realized that, they could sign a spiritual karma laundering contract. Their spiritual karma debt would be back at zero, and they would get a zero banknote. A million, there's some that has that magic ring. Because people in our society, being a millionaire is like, that's a dream, you know, from newspaper boy to millionaire. But when you look at what it is, I mean, if money is just an agreement and just some digits, then if you have a million, I mean, you have, yeah, what do you have? You have a million... When you turn on your computer, you see something on your bank account, and when you turn it off, it's gone. But when you exchange it, then it becomes interesting. But you see that that magic also gets strengthened by the whole money system, because we have an interest-based money system. And most people might think, because we grew up with that, it's normal that you have positive interest, which means it stimulates you very much to hoard your money and not use it. But when you think about it a bit more, actually the positive interest system is very strange. When we look at nature, there is no such thing as positive interest. I mean, if we would say here in Portugal, uh, you want to buy like 2,000 apples and you put them in a container and you lock the container here on the ground and you come back a year later, you open it, there is not magically 5% more apples. Probably what will happen is that all of them are brown and I don't know, you can throw them away. But during that year, you could also use those apples, give them to people, get things in exchange and build a whole community. A lot of alternative currencies or complementary currencies, they use no interest or even uh, negative interest, which means you're, you're really stimulated to exchange and to use the money and do things together. So instead of having a money which divides, like now the 1% and 99%, it's a money which I think the females, we are one. And we could even be one through money, just not the form of money we have now. And also in the past, I mean, in South America, people used cacao beans as money. It doesn't matter if it's paper, if it's, it's just an agreement. And cacao beans are even cool because when you don't want money anymore, you make chocolate and you can eat it. Another reason I made a million, uh, it's uh, Bill Drummond. He's the half of the KLF. It used to be a very popular electronic dance music act. Beginning of the 90s, for a few years, they had a lot of number one hits. They earned a lot of money, but then after, I think, three years, they got fed up with the whole music business. They destroyed their back catalog. Music was still phys physical then. So you could not order the records anymore. I think they went on the VMA Music Awards somewhere. They announced, like, we're getting out of here. Shot some blanks into the public. Left a dead sheep on the stage. I mean, and then you could not order records anymore. They counted their money. They had 1.8 billion pounds left. They had to pay 800,000 in tax. They went to a small isle, island near the coast of Scotland, Jura. And they burned those million in a fireplace. I think it took, like, 67 minutes. And uh, uh, it sounds maybe strange, but for me, they were always heroes because uh, eventually I did not only destroy that checkpoint Dermatropia. For the past 10 years, I've been destroying almost all my projects. I built a ship. I shipped it to the United States from the Netherlands, where we are, burned it in the desert, built a big pink tank, blew it up with explosives. And uh, it's not just about, obviously, I mean, it's like every little boy's dream to blow shit up and burn things. But more important even is that things have, when you think of them, they have a certain value, they have this impact. The first time a new record drops, a new movement gets born, it's magical. And then after a few years, it becomes this thing which just earns money. And somehow to keep that impact, a, a, a way for me to do that was to do destroy it, turn it into a kind of urban myth or something, and it could never degenerate into just a money-making machine. And actually, uh, as we see on this picture, I did meet Bill Drummond a while ago, and I thought it was pretty appropriate since he lost all that money to give him an infinite banknote. Yeah. And now when we look, as, uh, as I said, alternative currencies, which uh, a lot of people have already come to our bank, and I know there are people that know a lot about negative interest, about different forms of currencies, but other people don't know. 
So the nice thing is that since our money is just an agreement and we, I mean, some people here, I heard, do trust bankers more than people and friends, but most people do not. As a community, you can just start your own money. And one of the very interesting forms of alternative currencies is time banking. Time banking is based on time. Nowadays, what we see is there are more and more people that, uh, or actually less and less people that work really hard and have a lot of money, but have no time. But then there's this increasing group which has a lot of time, but absolutely no money. And now these communities are like, sometimes if you look at cities, places where people have no money, it's very depressing, it's bad neighborhoods, there's no social contact. And people, when they don't have money, they're sitting at home, they're using Facebook or television, getting more depressed. But with the time banking thing, the interesting thing is they do have a lot of time. So say you need your house painted. You can just ask someone else in the neighborhood, could you paint my house? If he works for five hours for you, you can pay him five hours. Then that person goes to somebody who can hairdress, pays one hour to the hairdresser, goes to childcare, pays three hours, and suddenly everybody there is happy and can do what they want. This whole neighborhood is thriving. But the other interesting thing is, and that's where you see how kind of indoctrinated we are with values, they will still be poor in euros. But it's, it's not, it's, the question is, is that important? Like financial value is one of many values we have, but if everybody can do whatever they want and have a thriving community, okay, maybe they'll have little euros, but then that's not that important. So it's the whole taking a bit away the magic of being the millionaire. We look really up to the Bill Gates and Zuckerbergs because they have this infinite amount of money. And we also somehow get taught that money is the most important reason for being here. Whereas I think our dreams are the most important reason. I'm not a religious person that I believe in a certain God, but I do have a feeling we are here with a purpose. And most of us, I mean, I somehow all my life have known that I'm an artist, but a lot of people have a talent or they know in the back of their head they want to do something, they feel they have to do it. But instead of doing it, they're being taught that, no, you don't live your dreams. First, you earn a lot of money. Then you become financially secure. And once you're financially secure, preferably when you're 65 and go with retirement, then you start living your dreams and what you're here for. And kind of, if I think like, are we here to make money or are we here to do what we are supposed to do or what is, what's our purpose in life, then I might be strange, but I don't think it's making money. And also, if maybe if you're just following your dreams all the time and like me, destroying all your work, you won't have a lot of money. But during that whole time, you have just been living your dreams. And uh, there's also this thing about money is security, money is freedom. But I don't believe, because I think freedom is freedom and freedom is something you can, you can be free with, absolutely, you can be free with 100 million in your bank account, but you can ve be very free with 100 euros. And I know that alchemists, a long time ago, they were looking for the philosopher's stone, that magical stone that could t turn everything into gold. I don't think anyone ever succeeded in finding it. But I have the feeling that money took on that function. Because what does it do? All these qualities of life are being changed into quantities of just measurable heaps of bigger or smaller amounts of cash. And I think it's that what money did, so the way money works also, if we use the word value, we just are thinking financial value. But we should add that because there are financial values, spiritual values, artistic values. It's like with the Van Gogh painting I showed earlier. It's worth 100 million. But maybe some of you here don't like Van Gogh but you love other artists and maybe their paintings are worth 500 euros. But then society will say, yeah, but the Van Gogh is much more valuable. It's much more financially valuable, but the other one might be much more spiritually valuable or artistically valuable. And what we see, it, it penetrates our whole society. For instance, let's say that there's a beautiful forest here and I have this idea because I'm a businessman banker that I go like, that's a beautiful forest. I'm actually gonna cut all the trees I'm going to make something stupid out of it. I'm going to sell it, earn a lot of money. So I go to the bank, I explain that idea, and probably they will give me the million that I ask for. But now there's another person somewhere here that goes like, there's this idiot on stage and he wants to, there's a beautiful forest, he wants to cut all the trees and, and sell stuff and make millions. So what do I want to do? I want to protect the forest and go to a bank and ask them a million to just protect the forest. I mean, I, I doubt that you'll get it. You'll get it from my bank, but... Uh, Otherwise not. And there you see that value has turned into this just purely financial value. And I mean, in my opinion, if we all will have a retirement plan, but there won't be any forest anymore, we are in uh, pretty big problems.
Now, uh, there's a new project, and the bank, our Exchange Vision Bank, is here, but we're using it to work on our new project. That's called the Transfer Money Tree. And again, this new project deals with our values and the different kind of values we have and what are our important values. So I said there's financial values, there are all these other ones. From the tree, which will again build in the Nevada desert, where there's no money until this year because we will bring money there, the banknotes from the bank will be hanging from its branches, ready to be picked. But the tree itself, we want to cover the tree with thousands of real banknotes. And we are asking people, we are not asking them for money, we are asking them for banknotes. And the interesting thing is that once glued onto the tree, they lose their financial value instantly. The 10 euros, the 1 dollar, the 1,000 yen, they become financially worthless. But they get another value because the tree becomes very valuable, especially if you look in that place where there's no money and suddenly there's this whole tree that looks at a different possible transformation into another paradigm of money. And it's, I mean, it's beautiful. It, it'll touch maybe people, it'll make them think, but it has no financial value anymore. And what else are we doing? And this is actually, it's kind of, it's money 2.0, we're looking at money where, again, people can regain power over money. And it actually was an idea sent to us that people said, like, okay, when we have money, and it's not our virtual form of currency, but it's real physical banknotes, why can't we draw on them, paint on them, turn them into art? And the interesting thing is that that extra value does not get lost. Maybe you think this is just a normal banknote, but this is a two reals from Brazil, and somebody cut up a five euro and glued it over it. And so it's turning money into art and then gluing it on the tree. And then a lot of people are asking me, oh, so you're going to burn it, that's cool. But we are not going to burn the tree. Maybe some people are disappointed. Because we, what we did already is that by gluing the money on the tree, we destroyed the financial value. Destroy might sound negative, or we altered. We exchanged it for another value. And it became a spiritual, artistic something. And by burning it, we would destroy that other value. Or And I think it is actually... It, it would be important, it's not that I'm greedy, but to do it on euros or money that really has some value for you. Because then it's also regaining power for money. When you draw on it, it does lose its financial value and you see something happening. And it's very interesting that we get emails all the time from people that write us that when they go through that process, what's happening in their minds. That deals with this idea that money now is very much top down. It's banks that issue money, they just that we see there's this whole idea about money, there's positive interest, there's, but it's just a tool. And we could regain power over the tool, as we see now with transition towns, that there's alternative currencies, there's the Brixton Pound, there's the Ithaca Hour, and there are more and more coming. And even in America, there's the Berkshire, and you can use that now also to pay your local taxes, which I think is a big step. And now in the Netherlands, we are working on making a currency which is only for art. So you can go to festivals, you could go to cinemas, it's all about community. A lot of them are locally. And it means that the money being used will only go to people that you would love to do things. Now that's the 2.0. That's one side. That's the other one. It also says on there, but even long after money will be gone, nature will still be there and we will still be able to pick things of real value from trees. Because so far I've never heard, like, if you go to a tree and you pick an apple, that the tree says like, okay, but first give me a euro.